wait for the notification. Okay, so welcome everyone to our second uh, featured speaker presentation of the semester. Um, these are these sessions are opportunities for prospective grantees to learn a little bit about past grants and also for past grantees to give presentations on the really cool work that they're doing. So uh, this uh, this week today, we've got um, Uli Ingram from Kennesaw State University. Um, she's going to present on her cartography textbook, um, which I personally think is super cool. So um, if you want to go ahead and get started, go right ahead. Yeah, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Uli Ingram. Like Tiffany already mentioned, I teach at Kennesaw State University. I teach GIS Corsa, so a Geographic Information Systems in the Department of Geography and Anthropology, just to kind of situate um, where I come from. So um, yeah, this was a very cool grant, I have to say. Um, I like the grants in general, and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big champion, I guess, of the whole grants for dropping um, textbooks and saving the students money. So to give context, this was in round 14, so I guess summer middle of 2019 through middle of 2020. I didn't know if Tiffany and Jeff wanted me to mention this, but for me, um, we had a staffing issue in spring 2020, which was supposed to be the final semester of implementation for me. I always, always teach this course in the spring, so I knew that was going to line up with a grant timeline. And then, of course, something happened. Somebody else took a leave of absence or something and things didn't go as planned. So what we did and, and Affordable Learning Georgia has always been super flexible. We um, ended up submitting the final report for summer 2020 and then I ended up actually implementing in fall 2020 and we submitted an, an amended final report in December 2020. Somewhat of an exception, but I'm certain that happens at other institutions as well. So I wanted to talk about the successes and failures of the application process. So um, hopefully, you know, if you've ever applied, you got the grant and it was easy going from there. But um, some of us had to try more than once. So in this case, um, the first application, it was, of course, an amazing application. It was very detailed and perfect. But um, the, re the, the feedback we received was that the savings just weren't significant enough, right? So we teach back then, we taught two sections of this course per year. So one section per semester generally um, with only 20 to 25 students per class. So even if the textbook, you know, cost $100, it just wasn't really significant savings, right? Compared to some gen ed course with hundreds of students per semester. So that was the, the feedback, you know? So I was like, how am I gonna get this to work? How am I gonna get a grant for this course? So a second time around, it was successful. And that's where the other team members come into play. So I transformed um, cartography. And then I worked with Dr. Rhodes, who transformed a different course. So 1130, World Regional Geography. And then Tiffany Reardon was on our team as the instructional designer when she worked at Kennesaw. So the way we overcame the not enough savings problem was that if you find more students with other courses or work with other institutions or whatever it takes to make it worth it, um, it might work for you as well, right? So in this case, um, we want to provide linkages. We want to introduce GIS to other geography students. And so it's very cool for us to work with faculty that are maybe not GISers, but they teach geography courses and they can introduce GIS in their courses as well. And that was kind of the connection between these two courses. Um, I want to give credit to Dr. Gilliland. Um, he worked on the lab portion of this um, OER resources with me in fall 2020. It was a brand new prep for him. So I think we actually had to add his sections late. Um, first section that I was teaching filled up, opened a second section, it filled up and then a third section. So Dr. Gilliland actually taught two sections in fall 2020. And I you know, gave him the choice, do you wanna use a textbook? And he said, nope, I'll, I'll jump right in with these OER resources. So that was awesome. And then he helped um, just for consistency and, and help with the labs in the end. So in general, um, if you have ever worked one of these um, grants or if you're planning to apply for one of these, this is just my perspective on 
you know, what the team members can really bring to the table and provide in terms of help. The um, faculty, of course, so it could be one or more. You know, they are really the subject matter experts. They, I know geography, I know GIS, um, and that's what I'm good at. That's where I want to spend my time when I work on these materials. And then there are people like Tiffany, or now we have other instructional designers who are really good at what they do, right? So they do accessibility, they do course design, they can do so many things that I don't want to do, that I'm not good at, um, that I don't have time for. So if you have the option of adding an instructional designer or librarian or whoever it might be, um, go for it. Um, I don't know at this point if it's required or recommended to have an instructional designer, but I would highly recommend it if that's an option. For us, we just ask them. We say, hey, do you want to work with us? Um, and then they can say yes or no. You know, they might be busy, but hopefully, you know, if you have somebody available, that would be a good fit. Students, um, I do mention students here. I, although I didn't formally include them in my application for this grant, um, that kind of was an afterthought. So in the end, after my materials were 90% done, I had two student assistants work with me that um, worked through everything. You know, so they had taken the course before um, using the previous textbook. So they had experience with those materials and they worked um, through it as if they were taking the course again. So they did all the readings, um, they checked my quiz questions, they added additional quiz questions, they worked through all the labs, um, gave me time estimates from the perspective of a student who was somewhat newish to the materials. Um, they made improvements, you know, suggesting like, hey, this is not clear, or the software changed, or the button is now located somewhere else. So if you can at all include students, I think that's amazing. Um, it just gives you that perspective prior to going live in whatever semester you're you're teaching. To give some background, I've taught this course um, once or twice a year since 2007. Um, we have used the same textbook, two different versions of it this whole time. So this was a textbook that's a standard cartography textbook. Um, if you search for it now on Amazon, the old edition costs um, between two and six dollars. It's quite old. Um, you're not going to find good copies of it. They're acceptable used copies. Um, the current edition, which is already quite outdated, um, is now expensive even for a used book. So I found it between $85 and $282. Um, I think it used to cost maybe $120 or so. And now um, there have been no new editions since 2008. Um, I think the author passed away. I don't know if the publisher is going to you know, somehow continue updating this book or just start over or what their plans are. So that's kind of the state we were in. We knew that this book wasn't being updated anymore. And then in addition to that, I'll mention the lab manual in a minute. Um, so we were kind of like, OK, what do we do? We, we don't love this book anymore. It's not being updated anymore. Um, it was a good book. It was a solid book. It was the book that people used, you know, for thematic map design. Um, to be honest, cartography doesn't change that often, right? So like Aristophanes measured the circumference of the Earth a long, long time ago, and that's the kind of stuff that's in this book. But every one of these books includes like a chapter on current developments or future developments in map making or cloud based technology, right? So I kind of give an estimate that 20% of these materials should be changed, should be updated. Um, so 2008 is, is pushing it for sure. So the additional component we had to um, contend with was the lab manual. So we teach how to make maps. We don't just talk about maps. We teach you know, GIS course on how to make maps. So this previous textbook had a, a lab manual, a series of labs with it um, that used a previous software essentially. So in the end, um, instructors face this all the time, right? At least instructors in technology courses, um, the software gets updated and sometimes completely replaced. So in this case, um, we still use ArcMap and ArcPro at this point. Those are the two softwares, but um, since the textbook is not being updated, um, the lab manual is now using what most people are considering the legacy software. So in that case, we're being forced, right? Our hand was being forced. We have an old textbook. We have a lab manual using a previous software. 
Do we want to keep that textbook? Do we want to write our own labs, update the old labs for our pro? Or should we just jump completely, you know, start over and use open educational resources? So <clears throat> in the end, we chose the OERs, you know, after that application was um, in the end funded. The main reasons that we went with OERs instead of a different textbook um, was savings for the students. That's primarily <clears throat> the reason for me. So we have students in our program that are non-traditional. We have a lot of students that come to us just for the GIS certificate, which is not um, covered by federal financial aid. So if somebody has to pay their tuition and pay the textbook and the textbook costs X number of dollars, more than $100, um, I consider that a pretty big deterrent for students coming back to school. The other two reasons are control over the materials, right? We can choose what we do. We can choose, we can remix, redistribute, and I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and it makes it easier for us to keep the materials updated. In all of our courses, all of our technology courses, we are faced with the software changes at this point outpacing the textbook changes, right? Um, whether it's ebooks or printed books. So it's hard for us to use a textbook and keep that textbook updated um, or make it match the software. So we have a new semester starting. We're using the previous book and all of a sudden, <clears throat> you know, it says to click here to make a map and now it's called something else. The software has changed and the textbook hasn't. So the readings that we chose instead of the previous textbook was fairly easy to find. Um, there were two or three pretty good choices out there of cartography books. This one was a good one. Um, we ended up choosing that one and used most of it, I think. I think we might have changed the order a little bit, um, and that's something that if, if you've been to the kickoff meeting or if you're exploring OERs, you know, once you're familiar with the Creative Commons license, um, you know, once you know that you can take a material and remix and redistribute it, um, that's a really good place to start. So we're not forced um, to use the exact you know, source materials. The platforms we considered for this course for the OER resources, um, I looked at Soft Chalk, I looked at Google Docs, and then in the end, the story map format. Um, if you go to the kickoff meeting, they will talk about all the options. This is not a comprehensive list by any means. Um, I have given every one of these a chance, so I tried soft chalk. Um, I have learned soft chalk. I've used it for my own courses. Um, I wanted to love it, and I don't. Um, maybe some of you guys are soft chalk experts. Um, I did their workshops. Um, I, I never got to love it. Never felt natural. Um, but it's a solid platform for anybody who has used soft chalk for their own, you know, course materials. It would be a good good um, choice for, for OER resources as well. Google Docs, I consider a super easy version of, you know, bundling OER resources. So I think Dr. Rhodes used that for um, his course, World Regional, <clears throat> and then the story map format. So let me tell you what a story map is if you've never heard this term. It's It has the word map in it, right? So it kind of sound, sounds geography-y but it, it actually isn't. You could create a story map without a map. Um, it, it could include a map, but doesn't have to. So for me, it's essentially a website. It's a very easy way to create a pretty good looking website. Um, I, I'm not an expert at HTML coding or cascading style sheets or whatever, so I, I don't want to become a website designer. This is super easy. So you can include text, images, graphics, you know, your JPEGs, PNG type of things. Um, you can do maps that are either static or interactive, audio, video, whatever. So if you want to click on that, get more information, <clears throat> this is the introduction to the story map created by the software that also creates ArcGIS. Um, there's other players in the market now that also make story maps, essentially. So the reasons in the end we chose this format was the ease of creating it. Um, I created a bunch of the readings um, for this course myself, um, so it's very easy. I ended up having some student assistants create some for me. Um, these are students who are not GIS majors. They're not geography majors. I could send them one email with instructions that say here, this is how you create a story map. Um, these are the source materials. In the end, it's copying and pasting and editing and formatting. So easy to create and maintain. 
Um, there's a collection feature that you're going to see in a minute, so it kind of looks like chapters. You know, you can number them. Um, looks kind of cool. I like the least le the ease of linking, and you can do this elsewhere. You can do soft chalk and Google Docs to link things from one resource to another. Um, it's just very easy with the story maps. I can go from chapter one and link to chapter two. I, in chapter six, I can say, let me link back to chapter two to reference something or reference a help file or whatever. I, it's just very easy. <clears throat> I have the choice of interactive maps and I'll show you that in a minute. I thought I was going to create interactive maps for every single chapter. It's pretty time consuming, so I think I stopped after chapter one. So that's one of these future development plans. Um, but the idea would be that if you do have a map, you can include a graphic, a static screenshot of this map and import it as a, as a JPEG, or you can actually embed an interactive map. So the student can click on it, make it bigger, zoom around, and more and more zooming brings up more and more layers. So that's kind of cool, and I, I do wish to get to more of that. It is an open platform, so I can set my story maps to either be shared only at KSU with the KSU login, or I can make it publicly available. It has accessibility built in, and it has the ability to export each story map to its own standalone PDF. Um, we actually had students ask for that. I didn't quite expect that because we embed these story maps into D2L, so I thought it was very easy and click and, and, and do that. I wonder if this question is about um, just if you don't have stable Wi-Fi, right? If you don't have stable data connections, that somebody can just download the PDF and read it you know, on their device. So what we had to do, how to create the story map for this course was we copied and pasted the text. Um, unfortunately, you cannot copy and paste like a 15 page PDF. You have to go paragraph by paragraph. And it kind of forces you to check the materials, and, and so it, it's actually a good thing. Um, we added structure, so we added a nav bar on the top, and then um, headers and numbering. So if I have a student with a question in Chapter 2, they can say, I'm in Chapter 2, Section 2.3, and I have a question. So the, the previous um, materials did not have the sections numbered. We inserted images and graphics um, with captions and alt text created that collection feature for the chapters, and then just added the links to the story map. So it's embedded in D2L in each module. So that was the readings. Everything I just talked about was the readings. So then how do you how do I deal with the this outdated art map manual, right? We, we teach cartography by teaching the students to make maps in the software. Um, we don't just teach about maps. Um, so I didn't want to write a complete manual from scratch. Um, again, it's very time consuming, changes frequently, hard to maintain the data. So we are fortunate to have a choice of, of just choosing courses and lessons and tutorials, help files that are already out there. Um, the company that makes ArcGIS um, also publishes textbooks, right? They have a company called Esri Press that publishes all kinds of lab manuals for each of their softwares. Um, and they themselves even recommend to not use textbooks anymore. They say to use their web courses and their web lessons. Um, they can keep those current more easily than they can keep a textbook current. So that's interesting to note that they, they even are recommending that. I went to a conference, to an education GIS conference, and the, um, they asked, you know, who is still using a textbook? Like it's almost an, an exception that people would still use a textbook in a GIS course. We did end up creating maybe three custom lessons for things that we wanted to cover that we couldn't find a lesson for. So I wanted to mention the challenges and problems. Um, I do think overall it's worth it, it's amazing. So I just wanted to mention some potential challenges. Um, it does take a lot of work and time. Anytime you redesign your course, anytime you either change from one textbook to another, or from one textbook to an OER collection, um, it's going to take a lot of time, right? A lot of times the publishers give us lecture files, PowerPoints, graphics, um, they might give us a questions bank, right? Um, if we completely switch away from one publisher, it just takes a good bit of time to, to modify all of our materials. There's the potential of, of your teaching assignment changing, right? So you have to work that with the timeline of the grant. 
um, existing OER resources that are out on the web somewhere might disappear, right? So that's a risk. Um, just like a, a publisher could stop publishing the book that you've chosen, um, which probably would stick around longer, but um, existing resources, if you're linking directly to a resource that you cannot control, that you cannot remix and redistribute, you could log in one time in September in the middle of the semester and that is no longer there, right? So that, that poses some dangers. Broken links happen all the time. Um, we just had a lab open, I think, Thursday. Student assistants worked through it two days prior to the module opening, and a link that was there is no longer there, right? It's almost impossible for an instructor to check every single link, you know, and make sure it's, it's still there. Sometimes it's a broken link just temporarily, and sometimes it's just gone. <laughs> um, you might have a poor course evaluation the first semester that you attempt these new materials and um, you just have to communicate to the students maybe say i'm working on this this is the first semester i have not used a textbook so let them be part of it you know tell them you know let me know any inconsistencies let me know any differences between my screenshots and the software um, so that they understand you're trying to improve the course and you just save them a bunch of money just maybe mention that and communicate that throughout the semester. Um, I wanted to just give some, some background to the other grants I'm working on because I want to mention what else I'm going to continue working on. Um, so I had a grant with um, another professor and um, actually Tiffany again back in 2018 <clears throat> for a lower level geography course and then introduction to GIS. I'm working on that currently. The final semester is this semester. And we're also using the story map format in that course. So this is the current status. Um, these courses um, do require work, right? Just like any other course, if a new edition of a, of a book came out, you would have to go and update your course and your LMS and so forth. So this is the current status. Uh, my 1102 is currently in soft chalk. My 3305, the readings are in story map format in good shape. Uh, my intro to GIS is in good shape. Um, we're working on additional functionality with this a lab, a lab collection in addition to a readings collection. And the final report for that is due in spring 2021. So let me show you this thing I've talked about for a long time now. Um, this is the link to the readings collection. So that's my, my textbook per se. So that's what this, this collection looks like, the chapter view. So I can say, you know, let me click on chapter one. What are the you know students reading in week one? Um, the images are copyright free, you know, and then you can scroll down. You've got this navigation bar. It's very consistent in every one of these chapters. We have an introduction. We have some sections and subsections, other resources which link to additional help files or articles or blogs, and then a summary of the chapter. Uh, we have this cover image. And then you go from there into each of the subsections. I wanted to show an example of this interactive map if that appeals to anybody. Um, so this could be just a graphic, right? This is a general reference map of the United States. Um, you just see some you know, cities labeled and so forth. Um, if you hover over it, though, you see that it's something that you can interact with. It's, it's not just a static image. So if I make this map bigger, I can actually zoom in. So if I say, you know, I could tell the students, you know, go read chapter one, go look at the reference map in, you know, figure 1.8 or whatever, 1, 1A. Um, you can zoom in, you can say, hey, let's let's zoom to Kennesaw, right? Um, and then more and more things show up and more and more things are labeled as you go. So that's the interactive nature of these maps. Um, you could do more, you could show a legend, you could add pop-ups. Um, so there's more you can do. and. That's something that in a geography course, you know, using these resources, I would like to do more and more. Um, if we show, you know, how do you create a dot density map instead of having a graphic, a static map, um, I would love to have that be interactive. And that just takes time to create these interactive maps. Um, so that's cartography, 3315. Um, that's the one that we're working on this semester. And I, I did want to talk about this grant for a minute. Um, I saw that Amber is um, participating today. So this is Intro to GIS, um, another course that um, we really didn't have the number of students, the number of sections that we could get this grant. Um, so I actually emailed Jeff 
um, prior to applying. And I was like, how, how can I get this grant? I'm in this situation again. I don't have enough students. We don't have enough savings. What do you suggest? And he says cross institutional. Go find another institution that you want to work with. They have enough students in addition to your students, you know, and I was like, OK, that's going to be hard. You know, how do I find people that want to do this? You know, we work together. Our courses are similar enough. So in the end, I emailed several um, around the state of Georgia and one one responded. So University of North Georgia, um, I originally talked to Dr. Bailey, who's on the team in the end. And um, so she was like, great, I love it. Let's work on it together. And in the end, um, she couldn't work on it for a while. She had you know, other grants. She was busy, um, just didn't work out logistically time wise. So I think we talked about it for maybe, you know, every time a new round was announced, I was like, hey, can we do it now? And she was like, I'm still busy. I'm still finishing up. So in the end, it all worked out. Uh, we're working with two professors at Kennesaw and three professors at University of North Georgia on this grant, which is 3315. And it's great. Um, like I said, we're implementing this semester. So just wanted to give that as an option. If you've ever considered cross institutional, that is one way to go about it. Um, that's the readings collection for that. So future plans, um, it's it's never quite done. So for 1102, I would like to move the um, current readings to story map format just to give the same look and feel. So if a student takes 1102, they see that format, then they take 3305, then they take 3315 and they have that same format. Um, eventually, I would like to create a story map collection for the cartography labs. I haven't done that yet. Um, would be fairly easy to do that. And then for 3315, we have a lab collection um, that's not finished yet. So if I click on that, I think we have labs one through seven right now. So we're still working on a few more. Um, so that's, you know, we have the readings and then we have the separate collection for the, the labs. Um, long term goal, we'd like to have our students be able to complete the KSU GIS certificate without any cost. Um, they can currently do that if they take very specific courses, um, but we teach three remote sensing courses and I'd love to um, have one of those at least not um, use a textbook. And I'm talking to the professor that teaches those to work together on that. Um, this is something that's not even related to this grant, but just because I like these story maps and I like the option of um, kind of having one collection that a bunch of instructors can use for various sections. I wanted to show this. Um, it's what we call it the information collection. So generally speaking, we would have these materials in our D2L in the start here module, you know, kind of how do you start as a student at Kennesaw um, who's never had a GIS username, who doesn't know how to connect, you know, remotely. So normally I would have my start here module and, and either you know D2L files or PDFs or videos. Um, but if I teach it and three other instructors teach it and there's a change to a website inside of my PDF instructions, it's hard to keep it all up to date and everybody using the same resources. So in this case, we have this link to this collection and all of the instructors from 1102 to 445 embed this link and then if something changes, you know, I could go in here and say, OK, now the link to the remote connection has changed. I update this, this one page and it's linked, you know, in, in everybody's D2L already. I would let them know if I make a change, but um, so it's a very cool way to just bundle a bunch of information that applies to multiple instructors in multiple sections. So that's all I have. I hope I didn't go over too much or speak too fast. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat window. Let me see how I can actually stop sharing. There we go. Well, Uli, uh, yeah, the uh, chat uh, stuff that we have is mostly um, about uh, some background on the project and then some background on the grants. Okay. Um, Tiffany has a, a pretty good question here. Um, the new story map that you got, is that already included within the links that we have to enter to cartography or is that something new we should add? So it depends on what we want to consider part of the grant or not, I guess. So the um, information collection we just made. Um, so that's something I would you know, love to feature. So it kind of be almost prior to the textbook, you know, however oh, cool. we work out the details. And then the lab collection is not done yet for cartography. Oh, that would be that would be awesome. I think yeah. 
Tiffany would probably get in contact with me about it. Yeah, definitely. I think that that sort of pre uh, story map would be really great to include um, as like a supplemental page mm -hmm. um, on your uh, on your open ALG page mm -hmm. where we link to everything. Um, I think that other institutions would really benefit from that too. Um, even just as a, you know, the KSU specific stuff would be sort of a model for what they could do at their institution. But some of the more specific story map stuff would be really great to include so that they can uh, give that resource as well. Yeah, and we're talking to, of course, UNG since we're working on intro to GIS together. So um, it's very easy to copy and paste these story maps. Um, so in the end, then we have some things that are very specific to KSU like um, we don't, you know, we don't back up our C drive, so we have to tell the students do not save any data to the C drive. If you do, it's going to be gone. So you have to save it to this other cloud location. Well, that might be different at UNG and that's different at any other institution. So, um, but you can make a copy of these story maps and then modify that, right? So we have these paragraphs that actually colored um, kind of case you color gold. Um, that are specific to KSU, but then UNG can say, hey, let's modify that. Let's remove this reference or change the color and point it to UNG specific information. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do we have do we have any questions about Uli's presentation or anything? Or about the grants? We had some in the chat that Jeff was answering along the way. While you guys are um, thinking or writing in the chat, feel free, of course, to ask your questions in the chat or turn your mic on. Um, but I will go ahead and read one of our chat questions out loud so that we can catch it in the recording. Um, so we had uh, from Jean Mangan, um, in thinking about Professor Ingram's statement about not saving enough money, does ALG take into account what size the course has the capacity to be when deciding whether there's enough money saved? I don't teach courses that have huge enrollments, so I can't ever say I save a million dollars a year or anything. But for the students who take my class, they are thankful for any cost savings. And Jeff did respond to that, um, that the estimates, we have you report them by summer, fall, and spring in your application. Um, and it is an average, so it's, it's not going to be a perfect number. Um, but along with the cost of the original commercial materials being replaced, um, all of that stuff is reported. And we also check on it every year. So um, we do a sustainability survey every year to find out how things are going. Um, and then the other important thing to think about if you guys are considering doing grants is that um, what we don't take into account for your uh, estimated student savings is the sole potential for direct savings to spread to other institutions or other instructors that aren't actually involved in the project. So we've had previous uh, proposals um, where they uh, have put in that there is a potential for the whole department to um, adopt the course, but no actual commitment to at least pilot that. And that's not something that we can include in your direct savings because we do want to be conservative and as accurate as possible with what those uh, savings are. So it's important to make sure that you are only including committed, at least committed for a pilot um, savings on your projects as you guys are compiling them. And and also, say, in our case, um, every time it actually turned into a department wide adoption, you know, I guess because we were forced to not use that old textbook anymore. Um, the other instructors all chose the OERs rather than saying, let me find another textbook and let me use this other ARC Pro textbook now. So in our case, even if we didn't anticipate that, you know, I think we asked them all, but you never know if in the end, you know, they'll actually use it. Uh, we had some part timers, I want to say for 1101 say, no, I'd rather stick with a textbook. Um, so we didn't include them in that case. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, 
Yeah. And then the other thing I will also add here is um, Jeff posted a link earlier on in the presentation to round 19. Mm -hmm. um, those are, we actually have a current round of grants open that are due, the uh, applications are due on Monday. So end of day, uh, you know, 11.59 p.m. kind of deal. Um, just like we do for our students. Um, so if you guys are considering and maybe you're ready to do it, but just didn't realize there was a round out, please um, take a look at that call for proposals and um, consider it. Um, did we get a link to your stuff in here? I don't think we did. The one to the re readings? <clears throat> yeah, I want to get your uh, your open ALG. It might help actually for you to post all of your because you talked about all of your projects. Um, yeah, I did want to mention the other ones just because they're in different states. So let me copy the link. Yeah. yeah, while we're doing that, does anyone have any questions? And I'll pull up your um, open ALG page too. Okay. <clears throat> so um, you've got your ArcGIS links in here, and then I am posting the OpenALG edition of it. Um, this is what we do to the projects when they get submitted to us. So. Uh, depending on the type of project it is and the format that it's submitted in, um, if there is a good, uh, you know, a, a reasonable potential for conversion, we will actually convert it to a manifold edition. Um, and so there are there are actually multiple ways that people can adopt this textbook. They can go directly through that ArcGIS. Um, they can go through the OpenALG with us, um, which we also link back to that original as well. Um, so there are lots of lots of different options, um, but this is sort of where it ends up once you submit it to us at the end of the project. And I don't want to I don't want to scare anybody saying that you might get poor course evaluations, um, but it's something to be aware of that if you um, in the end, I think after one or two semesters, you would generally see a lot of positive feedback in your evaluations that say we really appreciated that there was no cost, there was no textbook. Um, it's just that anytime you make such a giant course redesign, essentially for me it was right because I dropped the textbook, had to use new quest, um, quiz questions, had to create new exams, um, align everything with each other. So in the end, you know, you might have some issues the first semester. Just a cautionary tale, I guess. Yeah, that's good too. Um, that's a great question, Ashley. I just saw that. Does using um, story maps cost money? So we have a, 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 a license for all GIS products because we, you know, teach GIS and so forth. So our institution has a license through the university system of Georgia. Um, I know there are personal accounts, um, but I do not know. I think there might be a limit to how many story maps maybe um, you could use with that free account. Um, so I know that there's a free account, there's a student account, and then we have this you know, account that is licensed through the whole university system. So I don't have any cost myself. Yeah, so that's actually a good thing to mention is that um, there, there are a lot of tools that you guys have access to through either your individual institution or through the whole system. Um, that might, you know, they may not be openly licensed tools or always free tools, but can still be used uh, to create openly licensed materials. And so ArcGIS is one of them. I've seen uh, SoftChalk used at KSU before. Um, there are lots of, uh, a lot of what we recommend um, through ALG and through these grants is that you use the, the options that are available to you. And so if you've got something that's available to you that is not going to cost you any money, um, maybe the institution is paying for it, but it's, you know, it's there, it's available, um, and it's going to serve your purposes, make use of it. 
Yeah, for us, I think the word story map turns maybe some people off because it has the word map. You know, it sounds like geography for us. Any department at Kennesaw can request a username and can request access to the story maps. It's not limited to our department. So in some cases, this license might be housed in geography or forestry or biology or wherever, environmental science. But generally speaking, it's a university wide license. So like I have professors requesting licenses and usernames from me all the time that are in different departments. So even if you don't think you might have access to it, if you can find the one person at your institution that that has that access, they can create a username for you, maybe. Do we have any other questions? I think it's a rainy Friday and we all need to just you know, take take a breath, I think, with this crazy time going on. Huh? Yeah, we got I think you're also very clear, though. Uh, it, was, it was really cool to hear um, kind of all the basics of the program and the ups and downs of it. And it's real nice. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Got a couple of chats coming in. Sarah North says very informative discussion. Do you know if the participants generally have had a grant before or are interested in a future grant? We get a mix. Mix. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely get a mix. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I will um, for, first I will say thank you so much for presenting to us, Uli. Um, this was fantastic. Um, and another unique presentation. So you've given us some project uh, roadblocks and things to think about that we haven't heard about in other presentations yet. And that's really important and great to hear about. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. It's been great to even think about kind of reflecting on everything, the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got some more things coming in through the chat, but I will go ahead and stop our recording if that's all right.